Welcome to Conversations with Educators. I am Jerome Ellison, and today I have a special guest, elementary school teacher, Brandy Hayes. Thank you, Brandy, for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get right to it. Um, I like to start with a little game, all right? This game is called Start, Bench, and Cut. Um, so it's like a, like a team, right? So someone who you would start is like the best player in the team. Your favorite player, they have to start because they're the best. Okay. Someone who's on the bench, the thing you put on the bench is they're good, good enough to make the team, but they're not in the starting lineup. Okay. And the thing that you're going to cut, so I'm going to give you three options. The thing that you would cut is someone that they can't make the team this year. Maybe next year they'll try out. Okay. And someone has to get cut, someone has to get put on the bench, and someone has to start, all right? Okay. So okay. start, bench, and cut. Monica, Brandy, or Keisha Cole? Um, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I really don't listen to, like, music. Mm -hmm. I'm a real, like, old school head. Like, when I'm listening to music, it's, like, stuff from the 80s and the 90s and 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I guess all of them are kind of back. But, of course, I'm thinking of Monica and Brandy, like, old school. Yep. Um, so, start. Um, I don't know. You said Monica Brandy and Keisha. Keisha Cole. Cole. So it's just like Keisha Cole is probably going to have to get cut. <laughs> She's the more newer, newer school one. Yeah. She's maybe one that I've listened to. <laughs> I guess. Um, I will start with Brandy. I, I mean, not just because, but. <laughs> <laughs> Brandy, your name. <laughs> Like she's the only one out of three. I actually like have her albums and like know all of her songs, like know her music, music. Um, yeah, I would probably bench Keisha Cole and like Monica would like come next year. Okay. Next segment is like a reflective question segment. Um, the first question I have is, why did you become a teacher? What got you into the field of education? Um, so it's it's actually funny because I was talking to my mom. A a little while ago and she I don't remember how the conversation started but um we were talking about like this career choice and I remember telling her that I didn't always want to be a teacher and I didn't really decide that I wanted to be a teacher until I was a senior in high school and I have always been a good student and in high school um, particularly in high school, it sort of felt like I could clearly see the difference in how students were treated if they were good mm. students or if they were not good students. And I was friends with, you know, a lot of people who were both or somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. People who were good students like me, we got everything. We got, I, I got to go to like TV music awards. I got to go on like all the special trips and it was just, it just felt really unfair. Um, and it also, I also realized that if students who weren't doing as well has much positive attention as like the students who did well got, perhaps they would be different. Like they would be more motivation or whatever. So um, it was then that I decided that I wanted to be a teacher to, I guess in my head, sort of balance that out. But my mom is interested. She gave me this. She showed me this. <laughs> Like, what are you talking about? You've always wanted to be a teacher. Uh-oh. My old, like, <laughs> from, like, elementary school. Mm. And, like, every year, so they have this little box. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be when you grow up? Every year, I have school teacher checked wow, off. Wow, look at that. <laughs> look at this picture. Going back. Oh, <laughs> I have a few of those. Look, I have, I have one of those. I have a couple of those, too, with this old school background. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, like, I thought that was interesting. Like every year, literally in elementary school, it's like school teacher checked off, and I'm like, mm. I really didn't know. You spoke it into existence. Look at that. Yeah, spoke it into existence. Early age, early yeah, age. yeah. I like that a lot. I think, and I talk about that a lot with people as well. I feel like sometimes teachers and people in the field of education see a good student as someone who's compliant, right? Someone who's well behaved. And it can be some students who are so smart, intelligent, but if they're not compliant, they don't follow all the rules or they're not the most well-behaved, they'll get categorized as a bad student. They'll never be able to get the support and get the care and the love and attention, like you said, that they should get. So I think that's a great thing to think about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Um, so in, as you became a teacher, right, 
what has been the most challenging? Because it's a difficult job, you know, right? So what has been the most challenging thing you had to deal with as a teacher so far? Um, <laughs> originally, I was like, oh, you know, thinking about like students who were particularly, mm. challenging. I've had, you know, some of those for sure. <laughs> of course, of course. But I think the most challenging thing is the, the ongoing struggle of being able to meet every kid's needs. Like, that is something that I have never felt 100% satisfied mm. with myself as a teacher. And um, it's funny because we, we have, like, grade, le- grade team meetings every week. And I, when I started fifth grade about seven years ago, was ICT. And that, for me, was really hard because ICT, you know, it's like this idea of, like, inclusion and students can see you know role models and and to some degree yes but to the opposite extent which i think is terribly detrimental is like you got kids who are fifth grade level you got some kids who are sixth grade level and you got some kids who are third grade grade level level. Mm -hmm. and like you can see those kids who are third third grade level who struggled every year who struggle all the time they're in a classroom with other students who like the question is asked they raise their hand they get it Mm. And like, you can just see, <laughs> you can just see, you can see the lights go out like yeah. more and more every day. Like every, I don't know. It, it's just, it's really sad. It's really upsetting. Um, those particular experiences in ICT. So we were talking about that in fifth grade because one of the ICT teachers was talking, and I was just like, ah. Mm-hmm. Um, but but even in Gen Ed, like even in Gen Ed, I was gonna say that. Mm-hmm. Like, there's this range of students and these range of needs, and it's like, how do you sort of do that? Um, so I, th- I think I've gotten better with that over the years. Um, and I think what was like a, a big moment for me mm-hmm. was, was realizing that, yes, I'm the teacher. And, you know, the traditional thought of the teacher is like, you have the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, and as a teacher, it's like you're sort of in control of that like learning process. But the reality is like that, that's not entirely true. <laughs> like, not always the case, yeah. The, 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 the students, they are the learners and they know what they need. Like I, I say to them often, like I, as your teacher, know what I know about you from what I hear you say in class, mm. in your writing, when you're working, but you know yourself as a learner the most. You know what you need way better than I do. And like, you need to, you need to be more in control of that learning process for yourself. So I think over time I've tried to sort of release the reins (laughs) and like think of ways to have the students be more reflective Mm. regularly so that they're in touch with their, you know, their growths and their challenges, but then also think about how to give them the resources to let them improve from wherever they are mm. so that's been hard <laughs> mm-hmm. and, you know it's like it's an ongoing thing but i found that to be way more successful in terms of like the students really having that uh sense of it's like that 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 independent that agency that, yes you know? <laughs> What are those buzzwords that everybody? Yeah, one of those one of those mini buzzwords that they throw out every year. <laughs> True, like you growth can, mindset. Yeah, like they they care about their own learning. They have a sense of who they are as a learner and what they know and what they don't know. And if they're given the resources to help them, like this is where I'm at. This is something that I can use to help me. Then they're more willing to do it, and the growth is like is larger. And it's more satisfying for me as a teacher because you can see, you can see the growth and you can see, you can see them grow as a learner. Mm. And that's like lifelong, right? That's like, it. Even as teachers, it's like, I'm reflective. What am I yeah. doing? What am I not doing? And like, what do I need to improve? And so. That's it. I love that. I mean, I think that's, that's a life skill. And I think it's so important that we empower them to have life skills because the academics are the academics, right? Who knows if they'll use that math lesson or they'll use that science lesson in the future. But those life skills transfer forever. Like they can use that reflection. They can use that self-assessment skill. 
and they can continue to grow in whatever field they become as a parent, as a, as a owner, as a business owner, as an employee, you know, that growth mindset, like we said, you know, that can apply. It's a life school that can apply anywhere. Yeah. Um, and back to the challenge you said, I think that's perfect. I think um, I faced that challenge as well, right? Every teacher does. Having a, a wide range of kids, and as teachers, we're so hard on ourselves. It's yeah. such a difficult job. It's like you can never be perfect at this job. You can never be 100 for 100% right. because you can have 30 kids and you can teach the best lesson and hit 24 kids right. <laughs> that's a successful day that's a successful lesson but those other kids that you miss you'd be thinking about them all night like man i could have did this different man why didn't this kid learn it and you beat yourself up so much because you're not you don't feel like you were great for every kid but if you we teach them like we said to have that agency and to give them the resources that you can and see it from that way and then allow them to grow then just growth is, is enough, right? If we look at every kid has to be at this standard, then it's really almost impossible. But if we see where they were when they came into your classroom and it's the progress that they made and we just look at that progress, yeah. that in itself is fulfilling. That That is exactly what we want to do. We want progress because the progress is going to eventually take off and continue and they're going to reach where they need to be. You know? yeah. So that's, some, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, like I, I tell them too, like practice makes progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you all you need to worry about is like where you are and do you see your growth do you see you getting better and if you see yourself getting better then that's all you have to worry about and you should you should recognize even a small bit of mm -hmm. progress is something that you should celebrate so it's like celebrate those successes along the way because one it feels good to like yeah. see and two like that's what's going to keep, keep you going like through the challenges like knowing like i can see it and mm. it's good to like it's it's the, yeah, it's that confirmation that gives them the confidence, right? When they see, oh, I was, I made a goal, I reached it on my own. Wow, I can do this. So they just keep making more goals and more goals, and they become more successful because they keep accomplishing their goals, and their confidence increases, right? But I think one thing that we have to fight against with that is society and like social media, especially, right? I feel like kids and even adults, we're becoming programmed to always compare ourselves to other people. It's like we're always comparing ourselves to what someone else has how much progress someone else made. And I think if we focus on just our own journey and our own um, progress and we teach the kids to focus on their own journey, their own progress, that's more fulfilling than trying to compare yourself to the progress of someone else. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. Like, I, I do believe that. And I, when I think about, like, giving back assessments, I taught math. I've been teaching math and science, you know, for mm -hmm. all the years that I've been in fifth grade. This is the first year where I'm teaching everything. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. But, um, so like think I just kind of keep going back to math, but mm -hmm. I've been having this like discussion debate with myself over the cat the past couple of years about grades, and I've been exploring giving them their assessments back without grades on them, mm. so that it becomes less of I'm looking at this grade and like I am identifying with that grade, so I am this, but it also is a way for me to compare myself to others. So like. Mm -hmm. What'd you get? What'd you get? Mm -hmm. that, but to like actually look at the content of the work. Like, what did I do? What did I understand? What didn't I understand? So it takes away that comparative aspect um, and makes it more of a true reflective process for kids. So that's great. I'm gonna try that. I think that's great. This was like writing papers and stuff, not really giving a, a letter grade and trying just to give them the feedback and let them improve it. And it's, it, it, it's like, <laughs> When you think about the grade, it's like, what is the grade for? Like, mm -hmm. it, it has value in a sense, I guess. But really, when you give a student work back, you want them to look at their work and you want them to think about the quality of their work according to, you know, whatever the standards or the expectations are and then think, how did I do with those standards? And how mm -hmm. did I do? So the grade kind of hinders that process. Yeah. And... I have found over time, like talking to kids about why this is happening, you know, they're used to grades. So it's like, this is why I'm not giving you grades. They've been able to understand it and they agree. Mm -hmm. And like, it's to a point where they don't even ask. They don't even ask. Sometimes I like hide it. I'll put it yeah. like, I write it real small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But they don't even ask for it. So I, I feel like that's been really powerful too. Like, mm -hmm. Cause they're, 
you're un unprogramming them to focus on that grade. I know how many kids, and I know you have so many kids as well, who on one assessment, they received a 20, right? On the next assessment, the next one, probably the next week, they received a 70. And they'll be down on themselves because like, well, I didn't really get an 80 or 85. But you grew 50 points, right? So if we, they have that. If they look at it from that perspective, like you're teaching them, like, they, you made so much progress from before, that's motivating, right? And we've seen so many students who scored a 100 and then score a 98 and then 96 and then 95, and they're not growing, but they're still getting high grades, but eventually they'll get bad habits and not really know how to push through a bad grade or to push themselves to reach, put their best work forward every time. And I think if we teach kids to push their best work forward and not really worry about the number, then they'll always have that skill and that quality about them that can transfer, like a life skill that can transfer to anywhere. And I, and I also say to them too, like whenever I'm giving them back an assessment, even if it has a grade, like I think maybe on their post test, like their final test, like the formative assessments throughout the unit, I might not put a grade, but the end one I might. Um, but I'll say to them, like before I even hand it back, like we talk and it's like, you're about to get your grade. You don't know what it is yet. It could be great, it could be terrible. It could be somewhere in the middle. But again, like you need to not identify yourself with your grade. Your grade reflects not what you know necessarily. It reflects what you did on that particular assessment at that time, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, you may have like, I don't know, gotten a like 70 out of 100 or a 60 out of 100, but that doesn't mean that you don't know the math. Maybe it means you just didn't show your work for a whole bunch of problems or you made silly calculation mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's again like another, I guess sort of like you said, like a retraining, right? Like yeah. stepping out of that association with the grade and actually looking at the content and mm -hmm. saying, this show I understand or don't understand and sometimes it may not even be about like your understanding so it's it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it, it's so many great I think so many great points and I feel like that's that's the key and I think I wish in terms of standardized testing that we can work that into that whole system because that's a whole nother conversation that's a whole nother thing but a lot of the things that we brought up play out in standardized testing in terms of how parents look at those grades how the next like middle school looks at those grades, the high school looks at those grades, the college looks at those grades and how kids internalize that when they start to compare themselves. And if we can find a way where it's more about progress and it's more about the growth mindset, even with the standardized test, I think that will be better for the system. Yeah, because the standard, that's not at all about growth. It's at just, all. who are you as a student? Let me see the snapshot, who you are that I can like, assign to this number and that's what we're using to evaluate you. Mm -hmm. There is no benefit to the student at all. Really, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, it's not, if you want to be real, is it really a benefit to the teachers? Because sometimes we don't even see the data from those tests to actually make adjustments in our teaching for the next year. Right. So it's just like, it's just a thing that this gets done and we have to shut everything down to get it done and make it seem like it's this most important thing in the world. But the value isn't really as, it's not really what it's made out to be honest. Yeah. yeah. No. All right. We can go on forever there, but uh, <laughs> um, our next question. So we talked a lot about some things that we think should improve with teaching, some things that like a teacher mindset can help with kids. Um, so I want you to go back to you as a student when you went through um, the school system, who was your favorite teacher and why? So I have the most, I have a terrible memory. Um, <laughs> No, a lot of people say that, especially now. But my memory is like the worst. Um, my friends are always making fun of me, and I hate it. Um, so I don't remember. Like I, I've heard other teachers talk about like their elementary. I'm like, how do you remember? <laughs> um, but they're like two. There are two teachers. I've had great teachers. Mm -hmm. all so I like remember their names. Like mm -hmm. remember positive experiences for the most part for all of them. Um, but I have like two teachers in mind. One is my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Kennedy. Mm. And he was like, maybe my first male teacher. Yes, he was my first male classroom teacher, thinking about it now. And he was like a presence. He was like a tall, big black man. <laughs> he like came into his face and he owned it, you know? Mm -hmm. and you could feel that he cared. You know, there was just something about the way he spoke to us and he kind of just kept things real and like, he was also no nonsense. Mm 
sense. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, re- like, I remember just like, just, I always come back to this one crazy thing where like this kid disrespected me, like grabbed her. I was like, <laughs> but even with everything, you knew it was out of love and it was out of concern. It was like, you need to fix yourself because you know, you're going to end up like in a bad place. Mm-hmm. So he was one that I remember. Um, and then in high school, I had a, a biology teacher. That was biology. Mm-hmm. Science teacher. His name was Mr. Rimler. And mm-hmm. he was just like the cool teacher. Like mm-hmm. he could relate, you know, to everybody. Everybody liked him. He also had a really great way about taking like the science concepts and applying them to real life in a way that you could understand. And one thing that he did, I still have it somewhere. He made like at the end of this year, this at the end of the year, this packet about life. Mm. But it was like life lessons through like scientific content. Mm. And the way, you know, I don't know if he made this. Now that I'm a teacher, I'm, I know the like, teacher shared. <laughs> Maybe he found it somewhere else, I don't know. But, I just found it to be one of those like mind blowing things where it's like, wow, like this is so smart and so thoughtful to like share this with your students. It's not, it has nothing to do with like completing work. It's just, here's something for you, for your life, like moving on. And I, I don't know, they stand out to me as being really special. I love that. I love that. I feel like everyone who I've asked that question is, is always been about either two things I noticed so far, applying the content to the real world and making it real for them and making it something that they can apply to their own life. Um, And also it's been that caring piece. Like this teacher did something, did things different that I knew they cared outside of what my grades were, how I behaved in the class. They looked past all that, but they, they, they cared about me as a person outside of school. And that, those are the things that stick for a for a lifetime. There's some great teachers who probably taught better lessons than both of those teachers and crafted the best teaching point. And ref- but the ones that stand out are the ones who really care and the ones that are able to apply that content and make, make it make sense for you in your own life where you are right now. And I think that's, that, those are two great qualities as a teacher. Yeah. Um, next segment, um, this one is called Each One Teach One. So this is just your chance to um, give some advice as based on your experience as an educator. So I would ask you, um, based on your experience, um, what is one piece of advice you would give to a first year teacher who's starting right now during these times? <laughs> oh, God, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry that you are starting now. Um, it's a hard time for even a teacher like me and I've been teaching for a lot of years. There's a lot. Um, Just one. one. One gem, one piece of advice to get through it. One gem to get through it. All right, one gem to get through it. Be yourself and try to, like, connect with the students and have fun. That's it. Like, that's, 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 that's my sort of advice about life in general. Mm. Find a way, however you need to do it, find a way to like, find the joy of, of an experience. And I think, <laughs> like this year, I think I'm really lucky because I have like awesome students. They're great. Mm-hmm. But I think when I think about all of my years, especially the most recent ones, mm-hmm. I've really tapped into that, like how to keep it fun and how to keep it light and how to how to just like be yourself in a classroom and just connect with the kids and like have this sort of energy and I don't know, um, connection Mm. relationship that lets you be like fluid and flexible and responsive, but like still try to have fun. I like that. I love that. Especially during these times. And, And we even go back to the last segment, right? Those are the things, that stick out regardless, right? That relationship and that connection you have to that child, to those students. Yeah. Um, last segment. This one is called Choose Your Teachers Wisely. So um, I know you mentioned two teachers that you remember from your childhood, but this, 
it's your chance to give a shout out to anyone. It can be a teacher, it can be a friend, it can be a book, it can be a podcast, it can be anything. But just one thing that has educated you or inspired you to be a better person. Oh, give yeah. them a shout out. A, a shout out. That's not hard at all. Um, oh, okay. It's like tied to a larger issue thing of my own personal growth. Um, so I've been uh, wanting to connect more to thinking about the relationship between like teaching and culture and, mm. and cultural identity. And, you know, at my school, PSA, you know, PSA, it's not very diverse um, mm -hmm. in terms of like racial ethnic um, diversity. And so just what all is going on in the world too, it's like, and even, yeah, like even thinking about like last year when, you know, things were starting to <laughs> really build up and the parents, you know, sort of looked at me as like the black teacher of like, oh, oh man. You know, like, oh, well, thank you so much. And I know they're learning so much from you, like, particularly because I'm Black, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just like, like I, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, <laughs> teaching. I'm just teaching. But, you know, talking to other people and parents, and I remember having a conversation with a grandmother of an African-American mm -hmm. student that I had last year. And I remember, like, I, I felt very comfortable talking to her because we had talked throughout the year about lots of things. And just saying, you know, I don't, I don't actually think I said it, but I think she maybe felt it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't feel like I'm doing anything special. Like I'm not coming to the classroom and like talking about my blackness and like. Mm -hmm. um, but she said, just, just your presence in the classroom, like you being an African American teacher and you being, you know, smart and like educated and being in this sort of class and being a role model for them is just that alone. Life changing. Right, because they haven't had much of that. They haven't seen much of that. And she said something to me that, like, was, was like, wow. <laughs> so she was talking about, like, the white students, particularly perhaps at that school, but maybe generally as well. They're used to seeing Black women as nannies, she said to me. And I thought about it. And I thought about it. And I said, wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I get that. I get that. Um, and I, I also remember a couple of years ago, I had a student who we were talking about STEM and, you know, I was kind of explaining the rationale of why I think STEM is so important and talking about, you know, historically who's not been included in some of the STEM fields, you know, women, people of color. And like, I remember saying to them, like, this was an active choice that I made to say, like, I, as a black woman, you know, sort of have this compounded yeah. essence of like, I'm not supposed to be, or this is not something I'm supposed to be interested in, or it would be more difficult for me in society to go into the world historically and like do these things. And so for me to be here as a STEM teacher for you, like I feel very proud of that. And one of the students, one of the African-American students that I had in the class at that time, she came up to me either later that day or the next day and like said, like responded to that specifically, like saying like, thank you for saying that. like acknowledging that she felt a certain way about me being her teacher because, she, you know, we were, she, I was black also. Mm -hmm. um, and she like mentioned like hidden figures. Cause like, hidden mm -hmm. figures. Yep. it was just a very powerful, like, I've had some really powerful experiences around like, race and culture that I want to like keep with me. And uh, what I'm trying to do as an educator is think more about that, for myself, but also for my students. Like, they all have their own cultural identities that in school really just, it kind of gets tamped down because it's like, we're not worried about that. We're worried about mm -hmm. like, reading, writing, social studies and science. But like, now the revolution is like, well, how does culture play an aspect in learning and how does it come through? So if I give a shout out to somebody, I will give a shout out to Angie Nelson. Mm. Still in fifth grade. Um, she has done the like ELA portion of fifth grade for mm -hmm. But now having to teach everything, getting my like chops back in ELA, mm -hmm. thinking about humanities and the social studies work that we've done this year has been US government. I mean, the timing is like, whoa, right? Like changing the units around. And I, I know the curriculum maybe existed to a certain degree, but when I think about Angie, I think about how thoughtful she is always. She's always how careful mm -hmm. she is about thinking about students 
thinking about where they come from, like thinking about how they can like celebrate their culture and where they're, where they're from. And she has really worked into like the U.S. Mm -hmm. government civil rights movement. Just really critical questions to have students like, learn about the history of discrimination in the United States. Um, and, you know, to think about like their role in the society that we live in and what the future is. So working with her this year has been phenomenal, like teaching social studies again, learning, you know, learning more about the history of the United States mm -hmm. has been so powerful. And I just, I truly in my heart feel very like overwhelmed with love and appreciation when I think about her. Mm. <laughs> Shout out to Angie. And, and listen, I love that you mentioned Angie because I emailed Angie as well. So you should put a bug in her ear to come on the show as well. Because I know she's probably a little, she wasn't sure exactly what it was, but put the bug in. So I think she's great. And I would love to get her perspective on a lot of things as well. So thank you for, for shouting out Angie Nelson. She's great. So I want to say thank you, Brandy, for coming on the show. I really, really, really appreciate you. You are such a great teacher. You share so much great insight that I think will be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, and I just want to give you your flowers because I feel like educators and teachers, we don't get, even with this pandemic and us having to be frontline workers, essential workers and teach through this whole thing, people still aren't giving us the credit and, and respect that we deserve. So I just want to make sure I try to do it as much for as many teachers as possible. So thank you for all you do. I appreciate you so much. And thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. And thank you. You know, I think that this is so cool that you're focusing on teachers and talking to teachers about their experience and kind of giving the space for them to talk. And, you know, you know that I was kind of nervous about this whole thing. I was like, ah. Everyone is. Everyone is. You know. Mm -hmm. But the more I thought about it, you know, I, one of the things that I enjoy the most about teaching outside of teaching students is like talking with other teachers and having a space to be real. About exactly. Dealing with and like what our experiences have been. So thank you for creating this space and like this resource for all of us to share and enjoy and learn from. Thank you. That was it. I'm going to clip that and make that a commercial for the show. Cause that's exactly my purpose. That's exactly my purpose. <laughs> uh, yes. Thanks again. Uh, thank you for anyone who's watching. Um, stay blessed. And remember education over everything.